and order and, and get on the uh, uh, on your computer and get for yourself to use because you are now become you have this day become the residents the holders of resident knowledge that you cannot erase you can't go home and pretend you didn't hear this you can't go home and say well I really uh, you know my badminton game is coming on Tuesday and I want to spend my time on chapters you can't do that because you now know more than we knew before and you can't unknow it. So what has happened here today is bigger than any speaker. What has happened here today is the transference of the responsibility to you to become participants in this conversation, to become inquirers, to become intellectually interested in the conversation you thought to yourself, I'm never going to get to. I'm never going to try to figure out what a credit default swap means. Now you're part of the game. Now you're a part of the solution. And so in order to equip you, to give you the practical nuts and bolts to get after this conversation and take it with you, or bring it back to when you get to your computers, we've asked Alan Brown to close us out tonight with a, some set of specific slides that give you the materials that, that come from her, her extraordinary books. You're going to want the books, you're going to want the slide of presentation, and you're, want to, you're going to want to know how to get to Ellen Brown's other work because she has done so much work in this field for so many years. So I bring you the pioneer, the person who plowed the ground first, the person whose courage to get after this when nobody would even publish her books is here with us tonight. Welcome Ellen Brown, and listen carefully. As you've heard, there's one and only one state-owned bank in the U.S., and that's the Bank of North Dakota. Um, it's also the bank that has um, the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate on credit card debt, uh, one of the lowest foreclosure rates, and it's the only state that escaped the credit crisis. Um, some people, if the media, the mass media will tell you that the reason they're doing so well is that they have oil, they have an oil boom. But the oil boom didn't really start until 2010, and they were already, um, they had already beaten every other state in terms of being the only state that was still in the black in 2009. And also we have the model of 
40% of the banks globally, which um, are publicly owned, and they are largely in the BRIC countries, that's Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which house 40% of the global population, and which also um, escaped the credit crisis. They're also in Germany, Japan, Korea, and a number of countries that have really strong economies. Um, these countries are, the BRIC countries particularly, are growing like gangbusters. Um, the largest banks globally are um, state-owned, including the two largest banks by capitalization, which are Chinese banks. Uh, the largest bank by deposits, which is Japan Post Bank. That's a really interesting model. Um, this is the largest depository bank in the world. It's a publicly owned bank owned by the government of Japan. And that this is where the Japanese people put their deposits, and if what they invest in, they invest very um, conservatively, is in uh, treasuries, so or in uh, government debt. So in other words, you have a government bank funding the government debt, and they, they back it with the deposits of the people of Japan. The largest bank by number of branches, that's in India, the largest development bank, um, also Chinese, and the world's seven largest, um, or the, sorry, the world's safest, the world's safest banks are um, publicly owned, starting with one in Germany. Um, hmm, economic miracles tend to occur in countries that have publicly owned banks. This would be China, or publicly owned central banks particularly. This would be China, Korea, ta Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, post-war Germany, post-war Japan, Brazil and Costa Rica are models that I've written quite a bit about and that are um, quite remarkable. This is China, the red line, or sorry, the orange line. The one that cuts through everything else is Chinese growth, which is, I think, in the last 40 years. So it's just remarkable growth. And uh, Korea is simil similar. The, um, these are some quotes from Ha Jun Chang, who wrote a book uh, called um, Bad Samaritans, the Myth of Free Trade and the Secret History of Capitalism, in which he was basically arguing that it's a myth that the reason Korea and China and these other countries have done so well is not the myth is that it's because they turned capitalists, that in fact they did not turn capitalists, that they the, the governments own the banks, that they use those banks to fund um, um, productivity, to fund their businesses, and they help their businesses to compete with all the other businesses in the world, including us. So they are running circles around us um, in productivity, while our banks are basically feeding off our industry. Their banks are feeding their industry, supporting their industry, and that's their mandate. So he wrote, I thought this is a great quote, that at Korea's progress is if, if Haiti had turned into Switzerland, and that they did it by the government's own all the banks. So it could direct the life of blood of business credit. Um, so how is it that public banks are, do so well in creating these economic miracles that we would like to create here, for example? Uh, first of all, you're bypassing this middleman that is sucking um, profits out without actually producing anything. Um, between 30 and 40 percent of national profits in the U.S. are going to financial middlemen. And they, they don't really produce a product. They call it financial products, so it's included in GDP. But these financial products are not something you can eat or wear or um, do anything with. They're, they're actually, um, you might say, financial scams. Um, they, the public banks lend counter cyclically, so that means that when um, the private banks are pulling back because they're afraid to lend, because conditions are bad. The public <coughs> banks actually have a mandate to go out and make more loans. And so they support businesses that otherwise wouldn't be able to get loans, which is what we have happening today in many states. <coughs> um, and this is what I would consider the, their most important feature, that they basically cut out the interest. So you can save, well today you can save like half, 50% on the cost of public projects if you don't have to pay interest. So you own the bank, you get
get the interest back, or alternatively, you just don't char charge yourself interest. These figures are from Margaret Kennedy, who is a German researcher who um, unfortunately passed away recently, and she got her figures from the Bundesbank, and so she looked at different types of pro public projects, and she found that some, like garbage collection, was 12% interest, um, public housing was 77% interest, but over, the, over if you put them all together, it was 35 40% interest. And she also found that we personally are paying that percentage. Everything we buy is like 35 to 40% interest. And you might think, well, I don't pay interest, how could that be? But what she's talking about is all the little producers in the chain of production of a product are paying, they have to pay for their workers and materials before they have a product to sell and before they get paid 90 days net. So if you add all that interest, that, and then of course they raise their prices to cover their costs, including the cost of interest. So if you rate, rate, add all those, um, all that interest together, that's what you get, 35 40%. In California, we have the Bay, the Bay Bridge retrofit, which was uh, recently completed. It was supposed to be $6 billion, but by the time you add in interest, it will be $12 billion. The uh, bullet train, which is Jerry Brown's pet project, is uh, was supposed to be, or the, what they actually put to the voters was 9.9 .9 billion, and when you add in interest, it'll be almost double that. And the Delta water tunnels are going to be even worse than that. So in North Dakota, we have another model, and in, it was not about socialism, unlike for, perhaps in China. It was about state sovereignty. So it was the farmers who were losing their farms to the Wall Street bankers in 1919. Farmers are Republican, they tend to, and my, my mother's from a farming family, and they're all Republican. Um, even though they're no longer farmers, but they're still Republican because they have that sort of history of being Pennsylvania Republicans. So the farmers were losing their farms. They realized that they were losing them unfairly. In other words, that, well, the the bank and the railroad and the granaries were all one cartel. It was a Rockefeller cartel. And the granaries were not taking their grain, although it was perfectly good, marketable grain. And so there was a clear attempt to get their farms. And so when they realized that, they banded together and they formed a populist movement called the Nonpartisan League. And they won an election and they set up this bank. And it's been going strong ever since. It's been going particularly strong lately. I mean, they, they did have some rocky periods. Um, so this is the model, or the, the mo well, how it works. All of the deposits of the, all the revenues of the state by law go into the Bank of North Dakota. And it's set up as a DBA of the state. So it's North Dakota doing business as the Bank of North Dakota. So technically, all of the assets of the state are assets of the bank. So it's got a huge deposit base and a huge capital base. And this allows it to make a huge amount of, extend a huge amount of credit into the state for state purposes. Um, it's cap it was capitalized originally with a bond issue. And that's what could be done here. You, you wouldn't cost any of the city's money or, or own money. You'd be putting, you'd just be selling bonds to the public and um, they do not compete with local banks, but they actually partner with them. So for one thing, this reduces their costs and it reduces their risk, but, but it also prevents, the, the, it allows them to have this good relationship with the public banks, or sorry, the local banks. We've been told, or it would, well, we've been told by the um, Bank of North Dakota officials that if we wanted to set up a bank, that we should, not, we should partner with our local banks, that this is very important, just in terms of getting them as a constituency, which would support the bank. Um, so, so the way it works is that the local bank actually deals with the customer, finds the loan, and then the Bank of North Dakota comes in and participates in the loan. So they may put up, say, 90% of the loan, and the, but the local bank is really sort of the front office. So the Bank of North Dakota doesn't have any of those expenses of having to deal with customers or, you know, they're not taking deposits, worrying about checks and so forth. Um, they have lower banking 
costs for other reasons as well. They don't take um, bonus, or they don't pay bonuses, fees, commissions. They, um, they've only got one, one branch, or they don't have branches, they have one office, which is right there. And they don't encourage individual depositors, so you pretty much have to live pretty close in order to, to bank there. They don't have ATMs. And they don't do derivatives. They say, if we don't understand it, we don't do it. <laughs> um, and one, one of a number of um, perks of owning your own bank is they don't have to have these expensive rainy day funds. In California, there are all these little rainy day funds all around the state that are just there in case they run out of money before the end of the year, you know, when they have to collect taxes. Well, the big Wall Street banks don't have rainy day funds. What they have is very cheap credit lines with each other. So if they run over budget, they can just borrow from each other at 0.25% from the Fed funds, Fed funds market. So in, in North Dakota, they haven't gone over budget since 2001. And when they did, they just issued themselves an extra dividend from their own bank. And the next year, they were back on track. They didn't borrow. They didn't go into debt. And you know, everything evened out very, very well. And Jerry Brown right now in California has a bill on that says that if we um, get extra, re or extra revenues, more than we need for our budget, that it all has to go into a rainy day fund. This is supposed to be a constitutional amendment. So it goes into this rainy day fund to pay off the banks for the next collapse that everybody is expecting. Instead of using that money to um, restore the services that were cut off in order to, in this whole austerity push, in order to balance the budget. So we should be hiring back those teachers, fixing our roads, which are in terrible shape. We need, I think it's $700 billion of infrastructure in the next 10 years, and we don't have it. So instead, they're taking any excess monies and just setting it aside in this rainy day fund. Well, if you have your own bank, you don't need to do that. Um, the Bank of North Dakota had paid 30, $30 million a year in, um, in dividends to the, to the state up until recently, but I guess their, their dividend has gotten quite, quite a bit bigger now, so the last figure I saw was $40 billion a year. Sorry, $40 million a year, which is quite a bit for, for such a small state. It's um, 1 18th the size of LA County, which is where I'm from. They have a return on equity of between 17% and 26% ever since 2008, which is the, the credit crisis. Uh, they they um, give lo uh, uh, loans at low interest for local projects. They underwrite municipal bonds, and among other things, they provide for the community is prompt, efficient disaster relief. For example, in 1997, before before the New Orleans flood, they had the biggest flood that the country had had. And the Bank of North Dakota was right there helping to rebuild, um, doing a moratorium on foreclosures. I mean, they were there to serve the community, and that's what they did. It wasn't like what you read about um, Hurricane Sandy, where the, the insurance companies will say, I'm sorry, it was the wrong kind of wind, or you, know, you weren't covered for that kind of rain. And then FEMA would come in and very late, and all they would do is give you a loan through a big bank. So, so in North Dakota, they're really there to help. They re rebuilt the city very quickly, and you could tell the difference between. You could tell it was the the banks doing largely because the city was half in the next state, and the half that was in the next state lost a great deal of population. I think 17 percent of the population and the North Dakota side only lost 3% of their population. Um, so since 2010, we've, uh, 20 states have introduced bills for state-owned banks. The one that has gotten the farthest is California. Um, both houses of the legislature passed this bill for a feasibility study in two years ago. And um, Jerry Brown declined to sign it. He said, we have plenty of committees, we don't need another committee, um, that we can do this in-house in our banking committee, but they haven't done it. So the door has been opened, but what we need is a push to, to 
get through. And I think I heard him say, pri or I heard that he said privately, um, good idea, make me do it, sort of, you know, sort of the Roosevelt approach. So if we had a ground swell of support or a large constituency that was behind us, um, we could hopefully push through. And that's what I'm working on now in California. Um, so some of the arguments against uh, forming, a, forming a state owned bank or a city owned bank, which you are likely to hear, I've heard this from two, well, I heard this personally from one, I, I called the treasurer's office in California, and the woman who talked to me said, we don't have the money to, um, to lend, that we need our revenues for our budget. And the state treasurer in Washington State said the same thing about putting up a Washington um, state-owned bank. But in fact, that is not how banking works. Banks do not lend their deposits. You never go into a bank and the bank tells you know to pull out your money, and the bank says, "I'm sorry, um, we just lent your money to Mrs. Jones. You'll have to come back in 30 years. Your money is always there." The bank has a mandate to, I mean, what you have is a, a, um, a demand deposit, which means you have the right to demand that money, and when you do, they will come up with it. But they don't have it. They, they will get it. That, that's their obligation to get it. So they get all this money in all the time. All these deposits come in. They can spend them. They can lend them. They can speculate with them. They, well, they can use them. I mean, they're supposed to buy treasuries or something conservative, but they can use those treasuries as collateral in the repo market or in order to speculate in the stock market. They rehypothecate them, so that means they use it, the collateral, more than once. So it's not like your money has gone into a little box with your name on it. It's this great pool of money that comes in. Um, the reason we have a 10% reserve requirement is that typically, Depositors only come for their money 10% of the time. So here you've got all this money that comes in. Legally, it belongs to the bank. And the bank can do with it as it will. And all you have is a deposit account and the right to write checks and the right to demand uh, your deposits back on demand. So since people only come for their money 10% of the time, the bank has this huge pool of money that they get to use. And that is the benefit that we want. We want to get that benefit back for, for ourselves. Another argument here is that um, government revenues will be at risk. And another is that bureaucrats, big, bad, and big businessmen. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. 